about uh, was a teacher for for 25 years. I don't miss it, but I <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love the pastoral ministry more. But uh, they were wonderful years, and uh, many of the young people that I taught there, I kept in touch with, and have uh, celebrated their weddings and baptized their children, and uh, so it's been uh, uh, it's been a blessing. My life has been a, has been a blessing. And it's nice to be back at Duke. I mean, I uh, was pastor down the road here in Magna Conception, a wonderful parish, uh, a parish that is very diverse, a uh, parish with uh, many programs, uh, outreach programs, very interfaith centered with the Muslims and the Jews and other Christians. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful place if you ever get a chance to go down there for a Sunday liturgy, you will be disappointed. And um, when I was there for those 10 years that I spent there, uh, I had some relationship here uh, do with the campus ministry. Very little, but I always enjoyed it. And uh, also did a little something over at Divinity School, which, uh, was, uh, uh, which was also a privilege. So, so tonight we're going to talk about the social teaching of the Catholic Church. And I think I should say to begin with that when I talk about the social teaching of the Catholic Church, uh, I mean the teaching office the teaching office of the church. What has the teaching office of the church said? And it said a great deal over the past uh, 100 years about social justice. And even though what has been laid out by our teaching office of the Catholic Church is often powerfully challenging, powerfully relevant, powerfully reasonable, nevertheless, I would say Catholics in the pews uh, by and large, are unaware of the Catholic Church's teaching on social justice. Catholic so social teaching is called among Catholics the best kept secret in the Catholic Church. And there are many Catholics who know the social, social teaching of the Church and reject it. Uh, so that has to be said. A rather prominent businessman in my congregation uh, when I was uh, actually here in Durham. Uh, he told me that he heard that the Catholic bishops had written on the economy. He read it and dismissed it. Because in his words, our bishops write on subjects they don't know anything about. First it was sex and now it's money. They ought to write on the Bible and prayer things that they know something about. Well, I was tempted to give him two responses. Uh, one, I'm not sure who would listen to Catholic bishops if they wrote about the Bible and prayer, number one. And two, in the words of the irreverent iconoclast at this university, Stanley Auerwas, any church that doesn't tell you what to do with your genitalia and your money isn't worth belonging to. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it was. At his best. <laughs> so I presume in speaking uh, about Catholic social teaching that no one in this room denies that the Bible in general, and Jesus in particular, says a lot about social justice. The Hebrew words for justice are tzedakah and mishpah. Now, I refer you to, if you're interested in pursuing this doctrine or this teaching of social justice throughout the Word of God, throughout the scriptures, the Hebrew the Christian scriptures, I refer you to a wonderful man, John Donovan, who has written uh, at length on the subject of justice in the Bible. And he says that biblical justice has to do with fidelity to the demands of a relationship fidelity to the demands of a relationship. Biblical justice is not concerned simply with recognizing what is owed another person. In the language of the law, commutative justice, or justice where we have to respect what your rights are. Primarily, it means in the Bible, 
making humanity right with God and with fellow, our fellow human beings. Justice in the Bible means treating people with dignity. It's awareness of God's love for the outsider. Fidelity to the demands of relationship on one's, in one's life, loving kindness, compassion. That's biblical justice. Those are components in our conversation about what justice is. Even those who don't believe in the scriptures, we can make a case uh, for these virtues that have a way of binding us together uh, peacefully. So the parables and the stories of Jesus spell out fidelity to relationships, as you know, in graphic terms. One thinks of the Good Samaritan, the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus' own teaching in the Jerusalem synagogue, quoting Isaiah as his mission, open the eyes of the blind, bring some good news, release the captives. And that most radical teaching of Jesus in Matthew 25, if you know that passage, when did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you in prison and come to visit you? Well, Jesus here defines salvation, if you will, apart from religion, at least from religious practice. You were on the right hand of God in the kingdom if you fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the imprisoned, cared for the sick, even unconsciously. The criteria is not, did you pray? Did you read the scriptures? Did you go to the synagogue? Did you believe in God? But did you act justly? That's the criteria. This understanding of justice is at the heart of all that the teaching office of the Catholic Church has said in the past 100 years. Now, with that context in mind, let me turn uh, to some of the teachings of our Catholic bishops. At the heart of all that the American Catholic bishops as well as the Central American, South American bishops have said over the past 50 years, the heart of it is this encyclical of Pope Leo XIII, written in 1891, and it was entitled Rerum Novarum, which translated means of new things. The new things Leo was talking about were the results of the Industrial Revolution. In his writing, he maintained that the social question of his day was in direct relationship to the protection of the rights and the dignity of workers in an industrializing society within the nation state. The word dignity, dignity of the worker, the dignity of the human person, that concern, that truth, really lies at the heart of all the teaching that was to follow in the next 100 years in Europe, in Central and South America, in Asia, and here in the U.S. The human person is central. We're children of God, all of us, from the most hardened criminal to the most helpless of our species, the unborn. We support, not in charity, but in justice, what will preserve and enhance that dignity. The test of every law Every judgment made by an individual, every action taken by administration, by a church, by an employer, by a multinational corporation, is the dignity of the human person. Another component of Leo's letter, which was at the heart of the challenge of peace, the pastoral letter on war and peace by the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in 1983, also was new thing. The Industrial Revolution changed the landscape of the human person's self-identity and place in the world. The world of 1891 was not the same as the world of 1591. The dignity of the human person was under attack from a new front in 1891. One is tempted to say a new enemy. One often hears what has come to be a dogma. That is, technology is neutral. It's what humans do with technology that determines its morality. Well, 
I urge you, for another point of view, I urge you to read one of the most important books in, uh, in my history was The Technological Society by Jacques Ellul, E-L-L-U-L, The Technological Society. He brings a scathing and persuasive argument against that dogma, that technology is neutral. And as recently as two weeks ago, our Holy Father, Benedict XVI, has spoken again, out against a technological culture that swallows up the individual, that makes the individual a thing to be used as a, to achieve an end. But to Leo's credit, in 1891, and to the American Catholic bishops in 1983, new things were happening then and now, just briefly. In 1983, we just finished the Vietnam War. Nuclear weapons were stockpiled. The new things of 1983 were judgments being made to substantiate the use of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. Limited deterrence was the buzzword then. The Catholic bishops in 1983 said emphatically, departing from what has been a mainstay in Catholic teaching, the just war theory, I don't know if you're familiar with the just war theory in Catholic teaching, it's worth studying, uh, it's worth uh, looking at. Um, there, there is some criticism of it, and rightfully so, as, uh, uh, as history and culture unfold. But they said emphatically, that nuclear weapons were immoral. Stockpiling them and certainly using them. Here's just a piece from their letter, The Challenge of Peace, a pastoral letter on war and peace by the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. All of these things, of course, are online. Uh, the Second Vatican Council opened its evaluation of modern warfare with this statement. The whole human race faces a moment of supreme crisis in its advance toward maturity. We agree with the Council's assessment, the bishops say. The crisis of the moment is embodied in the threat which nuclear weapons pose to the world and uh, much that we hold dear in the world. We have seen and felt the effects of the crisis of the nuclear age in the lives of people we serve. Nuclear weaponry has drastically changed the nature of warfare and the arms race, and it poses a threat to human life and human and it's a threat to human life and to human civilization is without precedent. And so they go on to say, we write this letter from the perspective of Catholic faith. The faith does not insulate us from the daily challenges of life, but it intensifies our desire to address them precisely in the light of the gospel, which has come to us in the person of the risen Christ. And then go on, just bear with me a couple. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful letter, the challenge of peace. Catholic teaching has always understood peace in positive terms. The words of Pope John Paul II, peace is not just the absence of war, or you may have seen the bumper sticker that's uh, frequently out there called, If You Want Peace, Work for Justice, a relationship between peace and justice. Like a cathedral, and this is John Paul II, like a cathedral, peace must be constructed patiently and with unshakable faith. Order in human society must be shaped on the basis of respect for the transcendence of God and the unique dignity of each person. There it is again. We'll be hearing this over and over again as we discuss this. To avoid war in our day, we must be intent on building peace in an increasingly interdependent world. And in this letter, they want to spell out a, a, a positive vision of, of peace. So none of us has to be reminded, I think, of the relevance of these statements, given the, the crisis in the Near East, uh, the issue of those nations that have atomic weapons, and uh, certainly the issue between Israel and Iran, um, and the struggle of the West to contain that uh, diplomatically, and one really doesn't know where it's going. But our own 
attitude, I think, as Catholic Christians, is above all to do what we can uh, to continue to support a diplomatic, a diplomatic solution, if you will, or to, to, to the issues, these, these huge issues that arise. And then just finally in this little letter, uh, in this very fine little letter, Catholic teaching begins in every case with a presumption against war and by peaceful settlement of disputes. In exceptional cases determined by the moral principles of the just war tradition, some uses of force, as we know, are permitted. This is, of course, the, the big issue, isn't it? Uh, it's happening today in Florida uh, over the uh, gentleman who killed Craven uh, and uh, the issue of uh, sufficient force to repel an enemy. Um, and so it's has concrete applications. Uh, and so the whole case, I suspect, is going to be determined or is going to revolve around uh, uh, what was sufficient to dispel this teenager. Uh, so the arms race. The arms race, uh, the bishops want to say, is one of the greatest crises that we face. And when you realize how many nuclear weapons the United States has, uh, it, it, it's absolutely shocking. And of course, our argument is that uh, we have to have as many as the Soviet Union and of course, Russia has. So the point I make here is that the human landscape changes, and we can never, never respond to yesterday's question nor we can respond to today's questions with yesterday's answers and have any effect in enabling the dignity of the human person. So to their credit, the teaching office of our church has written about the concrete, existential, immediate realities of human life in this society. An illustration of the necessity of responding to the issue of the day close to home, the new things of our moment, is a pastoral letter of the bishops here of North Carolina. It's entitled, Of One Mind and Heart. Again, okay? you can get it on the web. There's a link for it. Of One Mind and Heart. Bishop Scotsman of Raleigh and Colonel of Charlotte. They're both gone now, but uh, they're no longer bishops, but they were when I was first here. Uh, they evidence their awareness of what is attacking the dignity of the person, especially the poor person, the poor family, the family ground up in the welfare to work uh, ideology, the immigrant family, the undocumented family. Their, le their letter is a call to the times, and not only to the times in general, but to our time, our place, as believers and citizens of this state. Let me just uh, point out something here. They give some examples. Uh, difficult questions on economic divisions. They said, we ask you to consider this. Why in the midst of economic growth does the imbalance between those who have and those who do not have continue to escalate? Why in 1993 did the incomes of the highest earning 20% of households increase by about $10,000 while the income of the 20% of households at the bottom income range decreased by $1,200? Why in the United States, which has the world's highest living standards, do 20% of our children live in poverty, while the child poverty rate in Canada is 9%, the United Kingdom 7.4%, France 4.6%, and Germany 2.8%? Would not the prophets call these the orphans of our day, those without the means to develop their potential according to their God-given dignity. And so I just uh, point out this, again, as a resource for you if you're, if you're interested uh, to uh, uh, one mind and heart. It's uh, uh, something that has been very influential in uh, the way in which I've formed my conscience. At the heart of our contemporary struggle to respect the dignity of all persons is what Robert Bella, a sociologist who carefully studies religion and society is what he calls the rugged individualism. You know this term. You've probably studied it if you have studied sociology. 
Um, and again, I recommend this man, Robert Bella, to you, B-E-L-L-A-H, perhaps one of the most respected sociologists, and particularly a sociologist of religion, uh, nationally and internationally. Robert Bella teaches at, uh, at Berkeley. He, what he calls this rugged individualism, it shapes our lives, he maintains, as does no other single factor. Rugged individualism is a horrifying, horrifying emphasis on me and mine. What is of supreme importance for us, Bella says, is for me to get to the well first before it dries up, the races to the swift, the shrewd, and the savage. As one man, married man I talked to recently said, I'm in a battle for the hearts and minds and souls of my kids. They want more and more and more, and they want it for themselves. What has rugged individualism brought for us, among other things, these shocking facts? Again, some statistics. One out of five children in our country grows up hungry. 40,000 each year do not reach their first birthday. 1.6 million children are kept from seeing life outside the womb. Every 26 seconds, a child runs away from home. Every 40 seconds, seven seconds, a child is abused. Every 67 seconds, a teenager has a baby. Every seven minutes, a boy or a girl is arrested for drug abuse. Every 36 seconds, a child is injured or killed by a gun. And if this is not enough, a black and brown underclass is arising in America that is shaping our lives as nothing like it. One black child out of three is poor. A black male has a life efficient expectancy of 46 years. There are more blacks in jail than in college. And these statistics are characterizing more and more all of the underclass, including uh, Latinos. Since Paul speaks to this experience, this cutting edge of American society which shapes our attitudes and our lives, he says, remember that you've been called to live in freedom. Out of love, place yourself in one another's service. The whole law has found its fulfillment in this one, say, this one saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you go on biting and tearing one another to pieces, take care. You will end up in mutual destruction. So these terrible events shape our lives. And unless we acknowledge them, confront them, write about them, lobby against them, vote against them, where, they're, where we have, can do that as faithful citizens, confront the political order, work toward their elimination, then we ask the question, uh, as the psalm says, when will peace come to Jerusalem? One of these terrible events facing us, in very contemporary, is immigration. What is a just immigration policy? Our Catholic bishops have addressed this issue in the face of broad opposition. Just last week, the North Carolina state legislator invited voices in support of, voices opposed to immigration reform. And those opposed have one solution, send them back from where they came. Now, there were many of us who were at the state legislature, I was one of them, uh, when this, uh, invitation to speak uh, was extended. <clears throat> Let me uh, point out uh, one of the, couple of the issues on the, uh, of the, the teaching of the Catholic Church on immigration. The Catholic bishops have written a beautiful pastoral letter on immigration. And I'm just going to summarize part of it. The teaching of our Catholic Church on a just immigration policy is this. We support the role of the federal government to regulate migration and to defend its borders and laws. And secondly, as Catholics, we advocate for the recognition that immigrants, as members of God's human family, are deserving and must be granted the appropriate dignity as our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Here again, the dignity of the human person is at stake. Bible clearly demonstrates that this God-given dignity is given to refugees, migrants, and to all those who are immigrants. Jesus himself was a refugee as a child and an itinerant during his public ministry. He taught us to welcome the stranger and to realize that in welcoming the stranger, we welcome Christ himself. 
So it's clear that the immigration process is in dire need of reform. Without the needed comprehensive reform on the federal level, states throughout our nation have attempted to address this issue legislatively on a local basis. And you know, those of you who are, are, are aware of this, what is happening in Alabama and Arizona and some of, some of the border states. The, the, the policy that they have taken. In 2007, the Catholic bishops of the United States proposed five principles to be considered in drafting any immigration legislation that is just, respectful of human dignity, and that of the human family. Let me just summarize these guidelines. The first one, people have a human right to work and to support their family in dignity and safety. Second, when work in their home and it is not possible due to economic hardships, People have a right to migrate to other countries and support their family. Three, countries have a right to protect their borders and also have the higher obligation to provide legal avenues for people to enter their country legally. Fourth, refuge must be provided to those who are fleeing their homeland and due to political, economic oppression. And the fifth principle. All persons, including undocumented workers, have a right to basic human dignity and should not be treated in an inhuman way by anyone. So as Catholics, we believe these five principles, based on the biblical tradition, are reasonable and implementable. I can't tell you the, the pain and sorrow that I have experienced with a farm worker, uh, with those who are in the landscaping, uh, business, uh, workers, where, where their families are separated, uh, where the husband is, uh, is deported and a woman is left with three or four children. Uh, and the three or four children are American citizens because they were born. It's, it's a brutal situation and I think that we have to, uh, have to uh, support a just reform and one that is not simply, uh, on the one hand, uh, an am amnesty, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, get rid of them. Well, I've spent a lot of time uh, talking about this first foundation upon which Catholic social teaching is based, the dignity of human persons. But it's central. Everything flows from it. And if anyone has his or her dignity compromised and often crushed, it's the poor, the vulnerable, the powerless, those without voices. And the second principle upon which Catholic social teaching is based is the call to community. The human person is social. The family is the central institution. And according to all evidence, the family is great. I'd like to uh, distribute uh, for you a minute, then we could have maybe a little conversation on, on the, the, the other principles of Catholic social teaching. Um, we we'll take a look at these and uh, directly affects human dignity and the capacity of individuals to grow in community. 
marriage and family are essential social institutions that must be supported and strengthened, not undermined. We believe people have arrived in the duty to participate in society, seeking together the common good and well-being of all, especially the poor of all. Any thoughts that pop out of you at one of the issues, the critical issues that we face in talking about marriage and the family as the central social institution that must be supported and strengthened? Well, you know, one heavy issue is gay marriage. Yeah, that's right. It's a big issue today. Right. It's one and, of the most very complicated questions. And it's, uh, it's now there's going to be a referendum on May 8th in this state uh, to define uh, to define marriage as between one man and one woman. What do you think of that? Well, I feel kind of torn because I, I feel like there's a prevalent conservative culture to try to defend that and that it, it somehow, um, you know, that it's going to, defending marriage between a man and woman provides a more proper, well-rounded household for development of children. That's kind of the, the, the biggest positive I can think of. And then, but on the other hand, I guess I, I feel like any person who loves another person is feels like tra tra tragically torn if they can't sort of be with the person to the full extent that they believe they should. Absolutely. What you say, what you say is absolutely true. Any other thought on this? I mean, anything about the government's role in defining marriage is it's pretty much a set of you know, presumptions, contract, right? If I die, I want this person to have my right of attorney and all my things. I want this other person to be to, like, to, to see me in the hospital. But you know, as far as religion is concerned, it's, that's, I'm not sure what um, the state necessarily has much to do with, uh, with the faith at this, for, for this juncture. Because they, then, just the way that the referendum is working, you can't do any if two people have been cohabitating long term, it, that, that they can no longer have rights for each other and rights, with, uh, rights even if they're uh, heterosexuals. So. But uh, I didn't think that this, help me out on this, I didn't think that this referendum was dealing at all with the civil rights of people. So that two people who wanted to have a commitment to each other, right. there was a way in which the law would handle their civil their civil rights. Because it's not written out within the referendum itself. The referendum is very quick. And you, the only union recognized in the state would be one man one woman, which is yeah. Do you think that that's, that, that, that's sort of that this is kind of a slippery slope argument that if if they define marriage as something between a man and a woman, then it's and the next step is no, to well they said they define any the only recognized union in yeah. the state is one man one woman. Not, not even marriage. They want to redefine marriage, don't they? I think they're no, right. no, they redefine the idea of a union. What, what, what is recognized the state as a long-term commitment from one person to another? But they, they don't want to define. They want to define marriage as between a man and a woman. Well, Am I that, that would wrong? be that would be part of the implication there. But that would be the only. Yeah. <laughs> this was this again. I couldn't agree more with you on this issue. I mean, as a pastoral person. Uh, over 55 years, uh, uh, I can't tell you the number of cases, situations uh, that I have uh, ex confronted in my pastoral life. I was in Berkeley during uh, the, the, the uh, center uh, of the AIDS epidemic. And uh, I, 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 just, I saw the way in which people were treated. And, uh, and of course, my struggle as a Catholic is uh, is certainly some of the issues that you mentioned uh, and, and you as well mentioned uh, about the love between two people and the Catholic bishops have published a uh, a letter on this to parents always our children speaking about uh, same sex relationships or persons who are homosexual or lesbian. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful letter, but it, of course it stops by defining uh, any physical act as immoral. But it speaks about certainly in affirming in affirming that. But this is a this is a tough one for me. Uh, I'm happy to hear your comments because right now our bishop in Raleigh is requiring us 
as priests uh, to support uh, this amendment and um, and to speak about it publicly uh, in the pulpit. Uh, and uh, it's a real crisis for me uh, to, 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 to have to do this. But, uh, but it's one of the things that anyway, the call to family, community, and participation, while, while the principle is clear and um, uh, we agree with it, the implications of it, of course, and some of the issues that arise from it, and the fallout are quite different. Anybody who else want to weigh in on this? I kind of identify a lot of what Brennan was saying a little bit, this idea that I feel like from the from the state's perspective, though, that I feel like some of these things about marriage are sort of not the same perception for religion as that thing about some legal rights for two people to share certain privileges with each other. Right? But then I am also torn a little bit what it's saying here, saying that, like, you know, the how we organize society does have an effect on human dignity, capacity, and the real growth community. And in that respect, though, I feel like. What I witness is when uh, homosexuals in the community feel these things threatened, like feel their their rights or their privileges threatened, they tend to retreat into a feeling of being second-class citizens, and that sort of really demoralizes them, right, from being to living up to some potential, right, or to feel like they can't express their full lives. And that seems to be kind of sad. But, it, it, but I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's almost a division of their people. That's right. Sure, that's right. But, but, but I also am kind of tempted, I am sort of trying the other way because I wonder about whether uh, loosening the definition of marriage sort of devalues it or it kind of makes it more, I don't know if it's a bad thing, but it makes it less kind of sacred, sacred or kind of, you know, you know very. Um, I didn't hear many arguments to what is something yeah. sacred doing in their state, you know, something. Right. Sacred is an individual who's sacred versus a secular state versus something else. That's right. a different issue altogether. Yeah, I would try to use another word for that. Maybe even in a society uh, like France, uh, the relationship between people is, is recognized as sacred or as, yes, uh, yes. as, as special. But even, even in France, you see this back, this weird, I think they are still not technically legal in France, but they have union of fact, right? Which is actually used more by heterosexual couples, couples than homosexual couples at this point in time, because they don't want to enter into this sacred marriage, because marriage is yeah. not sacred. Yes, I, when I went to I went to France when I was high school, and actually it's it it much more accepted and common for uh, couples to have children without being married. Yes. And that was, uh, I, I was in the Try to be too judgmental, but it is kind of—it's shocking mm -hmm. compared to our culture, how it's much more fragile. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks for that. Helps me. Thank you. Anyone else want to wait on? Well, let's continue. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, look at the rights and responsibilities, and someone would be willing to read that uh, uh, that principle. The Catholic tradition teaches that human dignity can be protected and a healthy community can be achieved only if human rights are protected and responsibilities are met. Therefore, every person has a fundamental right to life and a right to those things required for human decency. Corresponding to these rights are duties and responsibilities one another, to our families, and to the larger society. Seems rather self-evident. I think there's any objection to that anywhere? Uh, anyone? Uh, seems rather. Yes. Actually, it's not an objection, but it's just a, um, a comment, I guess. One thing that um, we talked about in one of my classes that I took, it was a philosophy class, an ethics class that I took last year, um, that I thought was interesting, is that um, you know something like the right to life essentially sounds very something that it sounds you know, like it would, it would be ridiculous to say that someone doesn't have the right to life. Um, but the idea, I guess, that um, was brought up was that uh, there are different like shades of the right to life. You know, if my right to life somehow precludes someone else from living, 
do I still have that right? Or, you know, if in order for me to live, uh, everyone in this room would have to run 100 miles. Obviously, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But, you know, like something like that, would I still have that right to live? And so I think it's, it's an interesting thing to at least think about is that it's not always just very simple. Yes, I obviously you know, have the right to life because everyone has the right to life, but it's that there are times when that right means something different from another time. It's also the idea of defining what a right is that because can you inherently hold a right that requires other people to oblige to something else? Can one inherently? Yeah. What's an example? What would be like a real example? Okay, so for example, uh, just theoretically, for example, like I have a right to exist here. I, my, my existence here does not obligate you to do something for me. But in other countries, they have a right to something like healthcare, where it requires someone else to do something for me. I, th I think another example where this is actually pretty big problem, this is actually big to me now, is about uh, end of life care. Yes. So the idea of like how much is too much to provide for someone that's very close to dying. Yes. And so in some there's there's kind of a variety of how different cultures react to this, but it's prevalent in this country that a lot of people are feeling like it's too much of a burden on people are arguing too much of a burden on our economy to keep somebody alive in such a frail state. And what's the quality of life there anyway? And does somebody also just have the right to say I can end my life without yes. us? And that be not considered immoral to like I can choose to end my life. And one of the problems is that um, I've heard recently is like it's it's a challenging problem because even if that right to sort of end your life with dignity is granted to a lot of people, you know, is it is there really not just also is there isn't there a possibility that the the, the older member of the family feels like they're being a burden on their family and that they're that's going to put pressure on them. That they need to end their life, you know, and and so it's like it's not an easy battle because, but it part of it has to do with money, economy, yes, economics, and the other is about um, which, which makes it sound very sad and sad. But then the other is like you know about pain for a lot from people who are suffering and dying a lot. Like you know, do they want to have you know to end their life with as little pain as possible? And you know that's about the idea of human, you know, decency, right? It's like what's what's the life we're living if it's constant pain, or what's the dignity of that life? Yeah, so it's the dignity. Doesn't feel what you need to do something. Uh, I, I, I appreciate your your uh, comments in this. These things hit home very much to me as a pastoral person. I can't tell you the number of families that I have been with in a hospital room where the question is. Uh, when do we uh, terminate these life supports? You know, talking to the family, sitting with them uh, in a, uh, and of course, this has been debated in our Catholic tradition in, in the United States, very uh, Chicago and some of the other cases there. But I find more and more, interestingly enough, that it's not becoming an issue with families. That is, I mean, it's an issue. It's an issue. I don't mean to say that it's not an issue. It's, it's crucial. It's neuralgic. But um, but there's a general agreement that uh, uh, mother would not want uh, want to live like this, or uh, and of course faith steps into this thing too, in terms of uh, life is not just simply here, but there is a resurrection which we believe in, which is also a quality of life. That art that's not part of the argument in a secular society. Uh, I was at uh, UNC, it's interesting, it's at Memorial Hospital just today uh, with a woman in intensive care. And her husband says to me on a ventilator, and says to me, what should we do? And my, uh, my, my response to him was, well, get the family together. Let's get the family together. If I can be helpful in, in helping you to discuss this, then I want to do that. But I think that it's the family decision that, that, that and, and so the, and in, in most of the time, my experience has been that the family is in agreement uh, with what is to be done. And I think that it comes out of a, a sense of, 
you don't want to use the word natural law, but a motivation that is deeply and abidingly human. It, it, it comes out of love for the person. It comes out of uh, a concern, as you mentioned, about pain. Another great thing, and of course this is disputed, I've, I've spoken about this in, in, uh, in groups with the, where there have been very, great objection, hospice care. Wonderful, wonderful. Hospice care, of course, uh, manages pain so that uh, as much medication for pain is given uh, to manage it. Uh, which may mean hastening death. Morphine, uh, as you increase the dosage, uh, no question about it, um, uh, shortens life. And there are those uh, in our Catholic tradition, by the way, who, who very much disagree with hospice. I find it difficult because my experience has been uh, only supportive of hospice and the way in which they, uh, they treat the dying. So this is a this is a big issue, and I appreciate hearing hearing your observations on it. And uh, um, we need to continue to think about it. And of course, when it hits home, then it's another issue. I mean, we can talk about this theoretically, and we should. We should. I mean, uh, what you sow in theory, you reap in practice. And so theory is, is extremely important. Let's go on a little bit then. Um, option for the poor and vulnerable, and they want to do that. Um, a basic moral test is how our most vulnerable members are faring. In a society marked by deepening divisions between rich and poor, our tradition recalls the story of the Last Judgment, and it instructs us to put the needs of the poor and vulnerable first. Across a great hurdle is, is, 
to deal with it, uh, with the, with the, with the poor. So, uh, anyway, uh, how about uh, uh, how about let's go down to the last one: care for God's creation. How does a Franciscan is particularly at your name for me? We show our respect for the Creator by our stewardship of creation. Care for the earth is not just an earth based living, it is a requirement of our faith. We are called to protect people and the planet, living our faith in a relationship with all of God's creation. This environmental challenge has fundamental moral and ethical dimensions that cannot be ignored. That's becoming clearer and clearer, isn't it? Well, our church, our church speaks out about these, and I just point them out here that while there are some issues connected with them, nevertheless, I think that as a church, as an institution, uh, we are remiss if we aren't addressing these issues, not only based upon the scripture, but also upon uh, our human insight as believers to holding those two things together.